So I want to look at Jeremiah's letter to the exile in the context of trauma, which I think is a very important context for everyone sitting in this room, uh, for the United States of America, and for the world's population, uh, given the amount of trauma that we are experiencing daily. And uh, the letter uh, in verse 7 really focuses on these words, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its, in its welfare you will find your welfare. And it goes on to say, build houses, plant gardens, marry, marry fine wives and husbands for your daughters and your sons. Uh, and the, uh, the picture it paints is one of settling into exile. When you read the letter, you come away feeling what? When you've read that letter before. What is it, what, what, how does it make you feel? <coughs> what? Positive. Uh, yeah, a little surprise. It's not what you're expecting, right? So especially in terms of the book of Jeremiah, which uses some very, very emotional lament language and talks about God's punishment in very, very harsh terms, this letter seems to switch us up. Uh, and one could almost say it's upbeat. Okay? However, does this mean look happy? <laughs> that is Donatello's statue of the prophet Jeremiah, which he crafted in the early 1420s. Uh, it's a marble statue in the Museo dell'Opera del Duomo in Firenze. And um, he frankly does not look happy. And in fact, if you look at this woodcut from Jacob Steinhardt, he looks positively agonized. Yes? So you're absolutely right to say it's surprising to read this letter, which on its surface seems to talk about settling in without a whole lot of trauma. Verse 5 says, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat what they produce. No hunger, right? They're eating from their gardens. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. Multiply there, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Hmm, interesting. Multiply there, going all the way back to the commission in Genesis 1.28. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, right? So again, that's a very, very positive message. It's a thread that runs through the entire Bible. The context for that message, however, and I wish you could, let me turn off one set of lights so you can see these slides a little bit better. Is that a little better? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, this is um, uh, showing um, a burning Jerusalem and refugees fleeing the city. The context of, of the entire book of Jeremiah is Babylonian exile during which there were three deportations, the first in 597, the second in 587, when Jerusalem itself was destroyed and the temple destroyed, and the third in 582 BCE. That is constant trauma, is it not? Um, and it means the constant presence of troops. Now, why is that context of exile important as we look at Jeremiah for today? Uh, it's talking about trauma building up over time, and that's when so many peoples throughout the world are experiencing right now. The trauma in Israel really began in 721 BCE when the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom. Assyria was the power in the ancient world and uh, basically destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel and, and depopulated Israel, sent its inhabitants to uh, various parts of the Assyrian Empire, brought in uh, other conquered peoples to fill the space that these uh, deportees uh, created. Uh, in 609 BCE, good King Josiah was killed in a battle with the Egyptians. Um, in, uh, oh, and I forgot, in 701 BCE, uh, Jerusalem was besieged uh, <clears throat> by the Assyrians. It was called off. Uh, but nonetheless, the constant threats to Israel, who is this ping pong ball, in the ancient Near Eastern world, uh, located between major empires. Uh, in 597 BCE, King Jehoiakim, the Davidic heir, was deported in the first deportation. 
And then in 587, the second deportation, Zedekiah was appointed by Babylon to be king, um, and Jerusalem was put under siege for two years. Think about a walled city being under siege for two years. Think about the hunger, think about the disease, think about the terror of that. And think about the psychological warfare that's being waged. That king, Zedekiah, was blinded uh, after his sons were killed before his eyes. Uh, so this was, this was brutal, brutal warfare. Uh, and this um, uh, second deportation is described in Jeremiah 37 and 38 and 52. So this building trauma for decades may, meant social and economic disruption, uh, a military in, uh, presence, constant military presence to ensure the payment of tribute, uh, because how else do you keep an empire going? You need tribute, you need taxes from the people, which put a terrible, terrible burden <clears throat> on the peasantry. You get all kinds of <coughs> internal refugees who are displaced by various battles, uh, all coming, rallying around for safety. Uh, you uh, are constantly aware of rape because since time immemorial, women are the spoils of war. And that repeats itself today. We have learned not a thing, not a thing, about um, except we know how to humiliate the enemy really well. Rape, hunger, disease, destruction of homes, destruction of fields. And within all of this trauma, Jeremiah is searching for life. And as, as Kathleen O'Connor says, she was a colleague of Walter Brueggemann at Columbia Seminary, uh, Jeremiah is searching for life, and that makes his book a work of resilience. And her book, Jeremiah, Pain and Promise, published by Fortress in 2011, can't see it down there, but you can see it over here, I recommend to you highly, because she, uh, she uses trauma studies for her uh, lens on Jeremiah. She also calls Jeremiah a survival manual for victims of trauma. And when you look at the book itself, it is a literary mess. If you read from the beginning to the end, you're going to be on a roller coaster and you're going to forget where you are, okay? Uh, there's no chronology. There's no real ending. Brueggemann calls it the ending with no end. And that disarray echoes the chaos of Babylonian exile. So the very structure of the book uh, is basically a kind of mirror reflecting the experience of the people. And that invites readers to become active meaning member uh, makers rather than passive victims. Uh, you, can't, you can't enter into the book of Jeremiah and uh, just passively be pulled all over the place. Uh, you, you really have to jump in and take hold. It's that kind of book. And I'm teaching that this semester. My, my students have, uh, I think, have experienced that in their gut. Okay, so why is that important today? Because of our contemporary context of forced migration and refugees. And just to refresh your memory, I looked at the United Nations Refugee <coughs> uh, Agency statistical report for 2014. That does not include any of this year, which is gonna blow the numbers sky high, okay? Just for 2014. 59.5 million individuals were forcibly displaced worldwide. Can you conceive of that? 59.5 million individuals. Half of those are women, according to the statistics. And the forcible displacement was caused by, by several things, uh, either persecution, conflict, generalized violence, or human rights violations, pick one. They're all lovely, aren't they, okay? Uh, and here is um, the desperate Syrian refugees in their puny little boats trying to uh, come to some kind of safety. And also according to the UNHCR 2014 report, an estimated 13.9 million individuals in that figure were newly displaced. And that includes 11 million within the borders of their own country. Think about that. Within the borders of your own country. Think about those of us living in Gaithersburg or Vienna or Alexandria. Uh, forced from your homes to live in, 
Iowa or Florida or whatever, but forcibly, well, I guess Florida. Um, um, that, that displacement leads to what we see in the picture. Um, tents, if they're lucky, cardboard shacks, if they're not, uh, debris, lack of sanitation, disease is a huge factor here. And according to the report in 2014, 42,500 people a day left their homes to seek protection. A day, 42,500 people. If we don't look at Jeremiah through the, through the lens of trauma, we're missing an opportunity to understand perhaps what these people are going through. And that understanding perhaps could lead to a better response on our part to their plight. That's, that's my major point today. We talk about theology in the public square. Jeremiah gives us uh, that theology for this crisis, this humanitarian crisis, absolutely defeats me. <clears throat> Sometimes I'm afraid to open the Washington Post in the morning to see another picture. And I refrained from showing the picture of that poor little boy washed up on the shore in, what was it, Greece? Okay. Turkey? Greece? Turkey, okay, um, washed up dead. Um, that is what we're dealing with, and we can't close our eyes to it. And let's think of another context. We're in Advent. Let's think of another forced migration that was biblical. And that would be the flight of the Holy Family into Egypt uh, in Matthew 2, 13 through 15. And I'll just read, <coughs> fresh your memory. I hope my voice holds up. <coughs> sucking a lot of lozenges the whole time. <clears throat> Matthew 2, 13 through 15, describes Herod's decree <clears throat> and the reason for this escape to Egypt. <clears throat> so the wise men have just been to, uh, the, magi, the magi have been to Bethlehem to visit the baby Jesus. And in verse 13 of chapter 2, now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt I have called my son which is a quote from Hosea 11, when Hosea is uh, rehearsing the history of God with Israel uh, and said, look at I, I saved you in the Exodus and you're turning from me. I don't understand that. So now this, uh, that text is repur repurposed here. And then in verse 16 of Matthew 2, we get a, an account of the massacre of the innocents, uh, of, the, of, of the innocence of the infants. In verse 16, when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and oppressive rulers always are. They're always portrayed this way in the Bible. And he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, <coughs> according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then, uh, <coughs> and then when he died, uh, the Holy Family returns. So do you see the parallels between the Holy Family uh, and forced migrations today? What was the, what was the Holy Family fleeing? Persecution, yes. Not so different from what's happening today in Syria in particular, but gosh, in Africa, name, name, you name it, right? So please make that connection in terms of forced migration and think about that also in connection with the forced migrations of the Israelites under the Babylonians. Okay, so there's our theology in the public square connection. <clears throat> So who is Jeremiah's audience? The survivors of exile. And that's very clear because in the superscription, the introduction that we get to prophetic books that legitimates the prophet's words and locates the prophet in history, uh, it says that the word of the Lord, the, the words of Jeremiah, uh, and when they came. Uh, and in verse three it says, the word came until the captivity of Jerusalem in the fifth month. <clears throat> and so this is an in indication 
that uh, Jeremiah is uh, active both before and during the exile. And the final form of the book is really addressed to those people who are in exile, the good figs. Um, and Jeremiah makes it very clear that exile is their fault. And this is why you said, I'm surprised, right, by the letter to the exiles, because Jeremiah wants the people to understand why they're in exile. And for him, they cannot move forward until they understand what it is they did to get into this situation, right? Um, and so in chapter 3, verse 1, there's so many examples. Uh, Jeremiah says to the people, if a man divorces his wife and she goes from him and becomes another man's wife, will he return to her? Rhetorical question, of course not. Would, would, not such a, uh, um, would not such a land be greatly polluted? Rhetorical question, yes. You have played the whore with many lovers, and would you return to me, says the Lord? And playing the whore is a reference not only to Israel's religious apostasy, but always its political alliances, where it decides that it can't depend on God for protection, so it's going to make alliances with other nations and pay them tribute which puts a burden on the peasants and distorts the whole economic structure, okay? So exile is your fault. Now what we need to understand is that a basic universal response, and this, is, this has been uh, borne out in so many studies of trauma, and sociological and anthropological studies across the world, that one of the, one of the primary ways in which people deal with trauma is to interpret it and to, to wrench some meaning out of it. It has to make sense, right? And often, to do that, survivors will blame themselves. Mm -hmm. So in sexual abuse, those of you who are clergy who deal with sexual abuse, you know that one of the hurdles is getting uh, uh, victims of sexual abuse to move away from this idea that it was their fault, okay? Because what comes with that is the idea that they are worthless, that they deserved it, that somehow they brought that upon themselves, and they are stymied, they're stuck, they can't move forward, okay? So the basic response to trauma is to construct meaning, and often the easiest way to do that is to blame oneself. That is a survival mechanism. It's a way of asserting control in, um, in a situation that seems absolutely overwhelming and out of control, okay? so. When the tsunami happened, do you remember reading in the newspapers about how uh, Muslim leaders in the nations affected by the tsunami said the tsunami came because uh, the Muslims were not worshiping Allah properly? Do you remember that? And do you remember the Western response, particularly from mainline Christianity? Oh, what a terrible thing to say about God, right? <laughs> that God caused this punishment, which is exactly what Jeremiah said. God causes punishment because you violated covenant, Israel, all right? But what we didn't realize is that was a universally normative response to trauma, okay? And what did we do? We vilified the Muslims, which doesn't, you know, it was just feeding fuel, uh, it's feeding the fire of our current Muslim hysteria, hysteria in this country, right? That's, that's a kind of submerged memory in our national consciousness. But I remember uh, all of the sermons preached about, well, oh, you know, God does not cause suffering, da 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 without realizing how do you respond to trauma. We need to understand that better, okay? Uh, so the danger of using a book like Jeremiah to deal with trauma is, as uh, Christopher Frischetti says, um, that, it, that using Jeremiah can have a positive and a negative influence. And he actually calls the whole Bible, and especially Jeremiah, a controlled substance, which I think is a great idea, right? <laughs> it's a controlled substance. Um, so uh, we all know that controlled substances can be beneficial, right? You, get, you need a prescription from the doctor to fix what ails you, right? <clears throat> but if you abuse that prescription, you are in trouble, right? So I think controlled st substance really does work. Um, he wrote an article on interpretation just this year that's a very interesting uh, review of trauma. Um, and the danger for using Jeremiah is that it can produce 
distorted long-standing, I should have put long-standing beliefs. I am worthless, um, I can trust no one because my world has been shattered, right? The world is a dangerous place. God is absent or violent, cruel. Those are the byproducts of uh, this particular controlled substance of Jeremiah. And that can destroy community and the bonds that link us to one to another, and we're seeing that unravel right before our eyes. Uh, right before our <coughs> eyes, the, the numbers of harassments of Muslims in this country, um, uh, the defacing of Muslim property, et cetera, et cetera, it's, it's, uh, it's reaching a fever pitch. We don't even know the half of it because it's not all reported. Um, and the isolation uh, of one person from another. <clears throat> so there's Jeremiah in the middle of this saying, build houses, plant gardens, marry off your children. And what he's saying is there's going to be no quick return to Judah. And there are prophets out there who disagree with him and are saying, oh, yeah, this is just going to be very temporary. We'll be back before you know it. Okay, um, uh, I was going to say next Hanukkah in Jerusalem, but Hanukkah wasn't invented yet. So, <laughs> um, and uh, basically, stay a while in Babylon because you need to accept your punishment. It's punishment justly given from God, and Jeremiah wants the people to learn the moral lesson that they messed up, so that they can move forward and rebuild community when they return. Does that make sense? Now, can someone outside of the community say that? To the community? No. No, you have to be, he's, he's a fellow uh, sufferer of trauma, is he not? He's the model trauma survivor, okay? So O'Connor makes the point, drawing from Judith Herman and Kathy Carruthers and um, the scholars of trauma, that the wounds of trauma are unspeakable. And in that sense, because you cannot express your trauma, uh, you are experiencing a second form of violence. The trauma is festering within you, okay? You can't tell your story, your feelings are shut down, and what happens is that violent experience of trauma is locked away. And when you lock it away, you lose access to the pain and to the loss. It becomes um, uh, kind of untouchable, and it exists, as Kathy Carruthers says, as broken shards of glass, and you don't know what's going to trigger it, and you become stuck because of that. And I'll, I'll tell a story, and I don't think my student would, I'm not going to name the student. Uh, this student was a veteran in my Jeremiah class several years ago, and we were doing presentations on motifs uh, in Jeremiah, and one of them was the motif of sound. Jeremiah uses the sounds of war mm -hmm. Uh, to get people in touch with their pain and their loss and that horrible experience of war <coughs> Excuse me. without uh, replaying all of the details because a little bit at a time is all that people can take. Uh, and if you don't do that, you'll be traumatized, them, right? <coughs> so uh, the, the uh, very creative group, very creative class, did a panoply of war sounds taken from contemporary war scenarios. And my student had flashback. And I had been working with a student, and I had been in um, touch with uh, the student's um, counselor uh, to get tips on how to handle the PTSD when it arose. And uh, you could tell that all of a sudden there was the, the dissociation. The student suddenly was elsewhere and started to shake. And the first thing I did was to walk over to the student and say, give me your car keys. Because this student was known to get in the car and drive and wind up in Pennsylvania and not know how he or she got there. And I took the keys. The student left the room. The entire room wanted to rush after the student. That's not what you do. Okay? You give space, right? Because there's that broken shard of glass that's, that's uh, uh, penetrating. <coughs> And um, a couple hours later, the student resurfaced. Okay, <coughs> if you're a pastor in a church, you need to know those things because chances are somebody in your congregation has PTSD or has experienced trauma. And it doesn't have to be in war. It can be through sexual abuse. It can be through, oh, there's a laundry list, right? But those are the kinds of things that you need to know. 
uh, and this notion of this lack of access. Robert Lifton, long ago, in studying the Holocaust, the Shoah, talked about psychic numbing. If you exclude feeling, then death is not happening. Trauma is not happening. And what happens to people in trauma is they become psychically numbed. And again, that is a healthy, adaptive strategy for the short term. It's an involuntary defense mechanism. It's a way to disconnect yourself from one's own past because your past is so painful, so painful. <clears throat> and I see a lot of military personnel in the, in the room who are going, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so how does Jeremiah <coughs> break through that psychic numbing as a model survivor? He uses incredible metaphors. The, I heard the hoofbeats. Jeremiah 4 is a, is a, is a <clears throat> perfect example of that. Um, he says, actually, verse 19 of chapter 4, the translation is my anguish, my anguish. It's really my guts, my guts. Mm. I writhe in pain, oh, the walls of my heart, my heart is beating wildly. You can almost hear that, right? I can't keep silent. I hear the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. Disaster overtakes disaster. The whole land is laid waste. How long must I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? Okay, so those are the sounds of war that trigger that whole traumatic experience. He's giving access to the traumatized uh, fellow citizens by giving them some language to talk about what they experienced. And then he goes on to uh, undo creation. This is very powerful. Verse 23. I looked on the earth and, oh no, it was waste and void. Hine, it was waste and void. And to the heavens, and they had no light. I looked on the mountains and Hine, oh no, they were quaking. And all the, oh dear Lord. <laughs> <laughs> in the morning. That's not even my children. Oh, sorry. Um, I looked in Hine, there was no one at all, and all the birds of the air had fled. I looked in Hine, the fruitful land was a desert, and all the cities were laid in ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. The undoing of creation is God's punishment for what Israel did. <clears throat> So what does Jeremiah do by giving them that language? He is validating the people's reality, reflecting as if in a broken mirror. I love that image. Their traumatized condition re-imaged in worlds of symbol and poetry. And so how does he re-image what they experienced? He goes back to Genesis 1, right? It's a really, it's an undoing of that Genesis 1 creation story. So he's using the anchor of tradition to get them to think about what happened to them. It's pretty brilliant, isn't it? Uh, he selects aspects of the disaster and tells it from different angles. And one of the prime motivators that he um, uses to break through uh, the, the psychic numbing is tears. Tears in the book of Jeremiah. To grieve, you must have access to emotions. Trauma varies emotions, and it may take generations. Again, I lived in uh, the West Bank for a year and for a half year earlier in my life. Uh, and when I went back with a student group uh, three years ago um, to see the apartheid wall, the separation wall, I sobbed uncontrollably. But to see how many generations of Palestinians now living in the same camps, that's generational trauma, generational trauma. And that doesn't bode well. For peace. So why is Jeremiah called the weeping prophet? Because that's his primary vehicle for breaking through the numbness. That's Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, Jeremiah, uh, the weeping prophet. Uh, also coming from his lamentations that are scattered through chapters 11 through 20. Um, and uh, those are angry laments in which he accuses God. And in accusing God, He's giving the people a model that validates their anger and their pain. And where and what is he doing? Who, who gets the blame now? Is it a focus on Babylon, whom they can do nothing about? It's a focus on God. God, you let this happen, right? And that, that shifts the game for them. 
They know God. They're in relationship with God. Babylon is someone they can't control, but they're in covenant with God. All right? So if you look at Jeremiah 15, <clears throat> this is one of his uh, more searing laments in the series. Uh, verses 15 through 21. This is the famous one. Oh, Lord, you know, remember me and visit me. Bring down retribution for me on my persecutors. Seriously? <laughs> okay. I'm so sorry. No one calls me in the morning. Okay. Um, uh, bring down um, retribution for me. I have persecutors. Know that on your account I suffer insult. Your words were found and I ate them. Remember that special text? Your words became to me a joy and a delight of my heart, for I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. I did not sit in the company of merrymakers, nor did I rejoice. Under the weight of your hand, I sat alone, for you had filled me with indignation. You made me angry. Why is my pain unceasing, my wound incurable, refusing to be healed? Truly, you are to me like a deceitful brook that like waters that fail. Whoa. God is compared to a wadi or um, what's the southwest? Uh, um, arroyo. Arroyo, right? Okay, that dries up in the summer heat, right? God can't be counted upon. So look at how Jeremiah has shifted anger from the Babylonians to God, who's behind all this, okay? And Jeremiah's public and personal grief has a purpose. Uh, grief, when it's public, shows there's a visible image of the end. It acknowledges loss. And it's also an outlet for his own sorrow over the people who would not listen and see what he saw. And I think Jeremiah is a precursor for Jesus uh, in Luke 19.41. Jesus wept when he looked down at Jerusalem and recognized the end that was coming. Jesus wept. Uh, we could talk about cultural symbols of grief. In the ancient Near East, those were very clear. Sackcloth, ashes, tear your hair, throw dust in the air. It's a way to participate in death symbolically. Uh, Israel shares this in uh, Jeremiah 6.26. Uh, he actually gives instructions. Oh, my poor people, put on sackcloth, roll in ashes, make mourning as for an only child, most bitter lamentation, for suddenly the destroyer will come upon us. Okay? Uh, but then you look at Western customs. Now we talk about the celebration of life of people. Where's the, where's the grief in that, right? Uh, people used to wear black armbands or black at funerals, and now they wear white. Okay, um, so customs have shifted. We could spend a whole lot of time talking about Western customs. People don't stop for funeral um, uh, processions anymore, right? In fact, they will honk at you, right? Yeah, you're dead. You're dead. Tough luck. I got to get to work, right? So it's a very interesting shift in the West that we don't, um, we don't recognize symbols of grief that way. And then uh, the last major point I want to, um, wh wh when do I have until? A few minutes before nine. A few minutes before so, nine. So you want to do questions maybe. Okay, I do, okay. All right, so Jeremiah really drives this home uh, in chapters eight and nine, and I want to spend the rest of my time on this. Um, in chapter eight, Verse 18, my joy is gone, grief is upon me, my heart is sick. Hark, the cry of my poor people <clears throat> from far and wide in the land. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their images, with their foreign idols? Look at the different voices in here. God speaking, Jeremiah speaking, the people are speaking. Um, is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has the health of my poor people not been restored? Oh, that my head were a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears, so that I might weep day and night for the slain of my poor people. Oh, that I had in the desert a traveler's lodging place, that I might leave my people and go away from them. For they are all adulterers, a band of traitors. There's the judgment again, right? So, reading that text, 
if you look at commentators, they usually attribute the tears, oh, that my eyes were a fountain of tears, to Jeremiah. Fred, Terrence Fredheim in Smythe and Helwes's uh, Jeremiah is one of those. Um, and if you look at the publisher's subheads in your Bible, often they will say, um, the prophet mourns for the people, right? They've made a decision about who's speaking. But the I, my, could be personified Jerusalem, it could be the people, it could be Jeremiah, but it could also be God. Many reject a wounded God who weeps, yet many ancient Near Eastern gods weep over the fall of their cities. God wants to weep in 822, but actually doesn't. But God gives permission to the people to weep. And I think it's a way of saying God's uh, own tears are blocked like the tears of the people. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has the health of my poor people <clears throat> not been restored? So O'Connor says these tears are a political language that oppose the language of power. God's tears show God's changes sides for a moment. There's no violence here. Mm. The tears of God are part of the imaginative literary enterprise that ruptures in theological language. So in effect, God is breaking character. He, God, he, she, is no longer the judge punishing Israel for its sins, but this is a God who's vulnerable to the conditions of the other. And if we had time, I would ask you to turn to your neighbor and say, is there room in your theology for a weeping God? Why or why not? Or do you prefer a God who knocks heads together? <laughs> do, you, do, do you prefer a warrior God? Okay. Do you prefer the God of God bless America? Uh, do you... Hmm. We, just, we just studied Joshua in intro. And they were reading Mark Twain's war prayer about the Spanish-American War. They were reading uh, Robert Warrior's Canaanite Cowboys and Indians. He's a Native American and says, Native Americans need to read with the Canaanites, not with the Israelites. Mm -hmm. So is there room in your theology for a weeping God? And to, um, to finish up in 910, uh, the text is translated, take up weeping and wailing for the mountains, a lamentation for the pastures of the wilderness, because they are laid waste so that no one passes through. But the Hebrew says, I will take up weeping and wailing for the mountains. And, uh, and the uh, translators, drawing on some other manuscripts, are not comfortable with God saying, I will take up weeping. And they change it to take up weeping. I think that's despicable. That is our inability, our unwillingness to embrace this weeping God who can help us break through our own numbness. Um, and in Jeremiah 9.17, God calls the mourning, keening women um, they have the skill of a guild. They jumpstart the grieving process, and their presence says death is real. And isn't it interesting in Africa and in Asia, keening women are still called upon. Do we have the equivalent in this country? No, we don't. No, we don't. Um, so, uh, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Three endings? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, uh, Jeremiah 52 is an historical appendix to the book. It ends it. It's an emotional letdown. Uh, and it says, King Jehoiakim is released from prison to eat at the king's table. Leaves us kind of in a liminal space. Um, uh, I had a movie clip. Remember Good Will Hunting? <coughs> when the, uh, Robin Williams embraces uh, Will and says, it's not your fault, it's not your fault, it's not your fault. Um, and that is the counter to the rhetoric of responsibility and blame that Jeremiah puts forth. Um, and so scholars talk about self-blame as a sign of a new moral self or something that shows us capable of making accurate moral assessments, uh, an effective coping strategy, all true for the short term, but not for the long term. Um, and that is because there are two types of blame. Self-blame, behavior self-blame, which you can adapt, you can change, and characterological self-blame, which is maladaptive, meaning I'm rotten to the core and there's nothing that you can do to change me. Um, and it's kind of like the difference between guilt and shame, and we have to ask what kind of, of self-blame is at work at Jeremiah. I think for him, ultimately it's behavior self-blame. You can change. 
you can have a different future. So I want to leave you with this, that meaning making in Jeremiah is a process, and everything that Jeremiah presents is provisional, it's multiple, and it's often conflicting. So if you look at Jeremiah 2 through 9, you see mm. God as warrior, mm. you see God as angry, aggrieved husband, and you see God who weeps. Mm. Three images of God that bump up against one another and they cannot be harmonized. That is the nature of trauma. So if you expect refugees who come to this country to toe some party line on theology that has to be like yours, what you want to see, think again. <laughs> trauma does not support that. Responses to trauma are multiple, conflicting, and provisional. Um, and the final question, is perfect obedience anyway realistic? How might this expectation be toxic for us mm -hmm. theologically? She won that one during Advent, okay? Um, so I'm gonna leave it right there. Do you have any questions for me? <coughs> I know it's like coming from a fire hose, yes. Was Jeremiah in Jerusalem when it fell, and was he taken into exile himself? Jeremiah disappears at the end of the book um, after the assassination <coughs> of <coughs> Zedekiah, uh, who was appointed. Um, his supporters feared there would be reprisals and he would be hurt, so they basically threw him over their shoulders, kicking and screaming, and took him to Egypt. And we never hear from him again. But he was in Jerusalem. Um, in uh, for the first two deportations, yeah. <coughs> so he really did experience the trauma, the siege, the whole thing. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. <coughs> On the exiles, um, yeah, chronicle three of them, and I guess there are others throughout the Bible. Uh, why didn't the oppressors just kill them off? Why did Why did they go to the trouble of sending them back to the homeland? Uh, you mean in the period of return from exile? No, they, well, when they besieged Jerusalem, uh -huh. why didn't they just finish them off rather than go through the trouble of marching them back oh, to Babylon? Oh, 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 oh. Uh, well, number one, that would take a lot of manpower. Okay. Uh, and number two, it would spread a lot of disease that would actually imperil okay. the, the troops. And, I mean, there are a lot of practical reasons, yeah. practical reasons for that. And number three, you want bodies to pay taxes. That is the huge, I mean, economics, bottom line, <laughs> bottom line. Yes. <clears throat> How would you extrapolate, extrapolate the message of Jeremiah not to the direct sufferers of uh, trauma themselves, but observers of trauma? And I raise that question because of our very connected world and where we have, you know, people of all, you know, connected to all sorts of devices, seeing what's going on, not just in Syria, but in Paris, and out in California, and they're not directly involved, right. but they're experiencing a secondary trauma. Yes, mm -hmm. they are. They are. And, and so we run the risk of mm -hmm. being psychologically numbed as well, mm -hmm. right? And so it becomes now knee-jerk. How many people did this put the red, white, and blue, the tricolor of France over their Facebook picture, right? Because that was the expected response, but it became so rote and so common that it lost any meaning, in effect. It's a, it, in my view, it was another expression of psyche numbing, <coughs> honestly and truly, because everybody was doing it. Um, and it was the expected response. And I had my millennials in my class say they thought long and hard about what they were gonna post because they didn't want to appear to be bad people. <laughs> in response mm. to that, right? So it's it's fraught by our um, internet culture, right? Our online culture. Uh, the expectations <coughs> about your brand, um, it muddies the whole water about our psychic numbing, mm. and it plays a big part in it. So I think we need to be aware of how we become psychically numb, and we do the knee-jerk kind of response <laughs> with the tricolor and whatever, and, and ask, does that really get at what we're feeling inside. So um, I, I think our churches need to be dealing with that. Um, uh, either I actually in the sermon, stop the sermon and say, turn to your neighbor. What did you feel when you heard the news? Um, discuss that, try to find words. Um, so you're absolutely right, we're affected as well. Uh, yes, uh, I think what's 
it's interesting hearing about this is part of trauma theory is also post-traumatic growth. Mm -hmm. That the reason to go through the grief and the anguish yes. is to develop meaning to become a right. better person or get some new understanding of right. yourself, your relationship with the world. Right. I'm looking at what eventually comes out of the Babylonian exile in terms of interpretation of exactly Torah and you can see exactly. where eventually, it, if they're allowed to do this, where it can go somewhere. It can go somewhere. And that's what's not happening to those of us who are observing the trauma. Um, we, we take it in, we do a little mm. knee jerk, and then we're done. Mm. Uh, one, one author, Oral Dykstra, um, who wrote a book, uh, Set Them Free, The Other Side of Exodus, said, we as Americans need to read the Exodus stories from the viewpoint of the Egyptians because we're empire. <laughs> um, we can't read as the Israelites, which yeah. really gets people upset. But when you think about it, it's true, right? So uh, we need to decide, okay, so what? What do we do to create a new community where the trauma can be healed, where this trauma won't be experienced again? And that's where we're failing, I think. Very good point. Yeah. Yes. Um, thank you. Excellent presentation. And uh, if you had talked about the needs and, and gave a great example of how we need to train our pastors yeah. and our clergy to deal with trauma, um, at the same extent, how are we as a, Christian, a caring Christian uh -huh. community helping our healthcare system to understand the biblical solutions and context of really where their work in the medical community comes from? I, there are people who are doing that. I mean, I've lectured at Georgetown Hospital um, uh, to the uh, hospital chaplains there. Mm. I've um, uh, actually, I teach in the military chaplains track and I see some, <laughs> some people from that track who I love and respect very much. Um, and Christine Pulaski, I believe, who's at Georgetown, has done a lot uh, to, to bring the Bible and, the, and, and trauma together. So it, it is happening, but you're right, it needs to happen more. Um, uh, I, I'll take suggestions on that. I'm, I'm free to talk to people to, in hospitals. <laughs> um, but you're right, it's, it's, um, it's a gap. But then again, in America, the Bible is losing all kinds of tra traction. So many people are nuns, didn't grow up in the church, never heard the Bible, hmm. except maybe caricature somewhere. So we, we have a lot of ground to make up. Um, so how can we get bring two people into our churches and turn on to the Bible as a, as a lens for dealing with these problems mm -hmm. today? That's, that's the challenge. Mm -hmm. And that's all on the shoulders of pastors. It's a heavy load. Mm -hmm. So seminaries also need to step up. Wesley is stepping up. <laughs> I saw Sam Marillo. He is part of the stepping up. Yeah, uh, we're trying. <clears throat> Any other comments? <laughs> 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 <laughs>